Greetings all. My name is F.A. Osarin. I am the founder of Dula Chronicles, um, and this is Reproductive Futurism. Reproductive Futurism is a virtual gathering in honor of the work Loretta Rawls and Octavia Butler have laid out for us to follow in their footsteps on dreaming and creating what a better future around what pregnancy and birth can look like. As birth workers, we're on the front lines of this maternal health crisis. We witness near misses, mistreatment from healthcare staff and obstructed violence all the time. Grieving and mourning are a part of our work and so is creating a new where it didn't exist before. This space, Reproductive Futurism, is to share with your comrades on what this future can look like. As said by one of our elders, Jenny Joseph, mid Black midwife, we are in the business of saving lives. Today, we are met with Nicole on um, using fertility awareness to achieve body, body literacy. Nicole is a fertility awareness educator. She discovered the fertility awareness method after suffering deep psychological and physical impacts of conventional birth control. Learning that many others had also been dismissed by their doctors about these issues, she began charting her fertility with her partner. She began blogging her experiences and now teaches information about menstrual cycle and body literacy, providing private consultation for those interested in learning their fertility awareness. Uh, Nicole, you there? Hello. Yes, hi. Hi. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to speak about fertility awareness and speak about body literacy. Um, I think it's really valuable and I'm excited to kind of talk about all this, really get into it today. Sounds good. So you have the floor. I'm going to awesome. see the spotlight for everyone. All right. Hopefully everyone can see that. We're just going to get right into it and kind of start with what is fertility awareness. Um, there is a couple different kind of things I want to talk about here just in terms of semantics. Fertility awareness is really just about understanding your body and understanding how your body functions and knowing exactly where you are. So this is more of a more of a, a body lifestyle uh, than it is a technique. Then we have body literacy. You know, this is a relatively new term started in 2005 by these menstrual health educators who were really trying to talk about how the menstrual cycle is a vital sign. And so body literacy means to really learn and read the, uh, and understand that language of your body. So fertility awareness can be body literacy in the sense that uh, you're using this method or this criteria to understand things about your hormones and also about your health. So the fertility awareness method then is just an umbrella term for many secular scientific systems for determining that small window in which you are fertile each menstrual cycle. So you're charting these daily diagnostic changes to your body on a graph, and we're actually using that to understand our health and our ovulation when we're fertile, when we're not, all of these other things can kind of be determined by using fertility awareness method. So the method itself has all these different implications and it can be used throughout your menstrual life. So in all different periods and in all different uh, aspects, it has value. So you can see here, some may use it for pregnancy achievement, some may use it to understand their metabolic health. Next here, I kind of want to talk about the rhythm of what it's like to go through a menstrual cycle. We're all familiar with the circadian rhythm, and that's the daily rhythm, uh, the rhythm of how our body and our endocrine system interacts with the sunlight and the moonlight, and uh, it has implications for our hormones. And one thing I wanted to point out here is that the diurnal variation of serum testosterone, the pattern of daily testosterone follows the circadian rhythm 
So you can see this morning time here is actually this pointer on this morning time here is uh, the highest point of testosterone for the day. And so the work day and all of these other things that we are kind of regulated by, you know, very industrial way of life is based on the daily 24 hour circadian rhythm. Uh, but menstruators have a different rhythm. We actually operate on a longer rhythm and this is called the infradian rhythm. So we haven't had the time to really understand this rhythm in the way that the circadian rhythm is understood. But what we're looking at here is a menstrual cycle, one of my menstrual cycles charted on a fertility awareness graph. And what you're seeing here is the infradian rhythm of the major uh, hormones that are interacting with your menstrual cycle. So these are estrogen and progesterone, as well as some of the other trigger, ovulation triggering hormones. So here you can see that our rhythm is not a daily rhythm, but instead more like a monthly rhythm or a, a cyclic rhythm. And our hormones are doing this dance in this rhythm. And at the bottom here, you can see I've lined up several of my uh, concurrent fertility awareness method charts. So you can see each red patch is a new menstrual cycle. So the beginning of a new cycle. And then in the middle there, you have this patch of fluid, which is denoted from these purple patches that you see. So you see over the course of many cycles that the rhythm, even though the day-to-day -day observations are different, the rhythm is the same. And so with fertility awareness, we're really curious about ovulation. We want to understand when we become fertile uh, for the purposes of contraception, perhaps, or just to find out when the major event of the whole cycle is going to happen, because that's actually not the menstrual period. Uh, it's actually a time of relatively low hormones. The main hormonal event of the cycle is ovulation, and it actually begins in the brain. So the brain the hypothalamus and the pituitary are actually talking to the ovaries and the ovaries are putting out different amounts of uh, hormones and then sending a feedback loop to the brain again. So there's this, again, this intricate dance between the brain and the ovaries. And so to kind of understand that further in the context of the fertility awareness chart, what we see here is an ovary and it's kind of follicle development process happening. And if we start with menstruation here on the left, this is denoted also in the fertility awareness chart that you're looking at on the right with these red days. So you kind of have this process of the follicle recruitment, the ovary picking a follicle that will eventually become an egg and be that month's ovulation. And so you have this dance of hormones where um, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, is actually getting those possible eggs ready. And then you have this transfer to estrogen rising. And this is the beginning of our fertility window. And what's marked here on day 11 on this fertility awareness chart, you start to see the effects of estrogen on the bar graph. So you're actually marking down how estrogen is starting to get pumped out into these uh, larger amounts through basically the measurement of using your cervical fluid. Um, and then you have the process of estrogen peaking, LH, which is luteinizing hormone, surging and bursting the egg out of the ovary itself. So that is what we call ovulation that occurs here in the chart the last day before this temperature rise. And then after the egg has actually left, the follicle turns into this thing called the corpus luteum. It's a temporary endocrine organ, and its job is to release progesterone. So what you see in a fertility awareness chart is you see a rise in waking body temperature. That's these uh, dots on this line graph here that are showing the post-ovulatory progesterone rise. So we're able to see our hormones and how they interact with uh, ovulation throughout the menstrual cycle uh, through basically charting on this graph. And we're doing two things in this chart. Uh, we're looking at a bar graph and a line graph, and they're overlapped. And that's how we're making this 
determination about where we are in our menstrual cycle. So again, just to kind of take a look at it, if you've never spent time with fertility awareness charts, if you don't necessarily understand what it is, we're basically taking a bar graph and a line graph. The bar graph is a denotation of our cervical fluid, and the line graph is denoting our waking body temperature. So I'm going to get into more of that next. So here again is just a, an image of what a whole menstrual cycle, healthy menstrual cycle will look like. Um, you have a patch of cervical fluid in the center of the cycle, that's your fertile window, and that culminates with ovulation, which is the release of the egg, and the thermal shift, which is when you have that high progesterone that's actually raising your temperature. So here we also have how do we actually measure these things, right? So in fertility awareness, we're using cervical mucus. So it's an observation that we're taking on our uh, fluid every day. Um, and we're using that, we're marking that down and we're understanding that pattern throughout the cycle. Uh, what a healthy pattern looks like and also what a, a pattern that is not healthy looks like. Um, there's waking body temperature, which is the other primary thing that we're doing every day to perform this method. And that's basically when I'm waking up in the morning, I'm rolling over and I'm taking my temperature before I get up out of bed. And lastly, the, there's the optional uh, cervical position. This is where you're basically going to do an internal check and feel your cervix and take an observation of it. So. Let's talk about cervical fluid first, infertility awareness. Basically, when this method was created, the different types of fertile quality cervical fluid, which is necessary for uh, sperm to meet with an egg, uh, they were kind of categorized out and made into simple categories for people to follow. Now, your fluid may not look like any of these photos. These are photos of my fluid to show you exactly um, what that looks like for me, but it's all a spectrum. And so as you become more well-versed in charting, you will start to understand uh, more of what your typical cervical fluid pattern is. Um, so there's dry, which is basically where there's no cervical fluid observed. There's sticky, which is more of a tacky fluid. Uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of body. And then there's creamy, which does have a lot of body. It's very lotiony. It's very obvious. Um, you'll see it on toilet tissue. It has, you know, it holds um, its weight. It's very lotiony. Um, and then there's watery, which is that drippy fluid, that feeling, that sensation that you may have that your uh, vagina is wet or your vulva is wet. Um, that is really watery cervical fluid that you're feeling. And then the last category is stretchy or egg white. And this is a specific fluid that is highly fertile that um, can stretch between your fingers. So these are the main observations that we're taking. And how we take them is, um, you know, there's a multitude of ways in, in this method to take these observations. And it's best when you're taking them more than once a day. So Going to the bathroom is one way that we kind of check cervical fluid quickly. Um, so that's something that I definitely utilize and teach. And then here's a, a little bit more about cervical position and how this works as a corroborating sign. Your cervical position changes in response to estrogen, just like your cervical fluid is produced uh, in the preovulatory period. So at the same time, your cervix actually rises higher in the vaginal canal. It softens and it opens um, again to, you know, prepare for ovulation. So your body's doing all of these processes at once. Um, so we actually feel our cervixes to, you know, get into a better relationship with our cervix and to understand when uh, it is fertile and when it is corroborating fertility with the other fertility signs. And again, here's waking body temperature. So 
it's a line graph. It's very simple. You're taking your temperature when you're waking up, but still lying down and you're trying to get your resting metabolic rate. So you're just trying to get a very even reading on your temperature once a day, every day at your waking point so that we can read this small, about a half a degree shift in temperature that is a very reliable way to identify ovulation. So it doesn't have to be at the exact same time, but usually in the range in which you are waking up from a sleep that was longer than four hours, and you'll get an accurate reading for that day. And typically there's this biphasic pattern that you see here where the day-to-day -day temperatures go up and down, but there are two main phases, the follicular or preovulatory phase and the luteal postovulatory phase where there is a significant rise in temperature that sustains. So here's a picture of all of these things happening together. You have a hormonal dance happening, you have the rise of basal body temperature that correlates with progesterone, and there's the corpus luteum that is making that from the burst follicle. You have LH here. This is the spike that actually releases the egg. So you can kind of see in this you know, whole graph, uh, you have all of these different parts of your reproductive system that are interacting with these hormones. So we really only talk about ovulation in terms of someone who wants to conceive, someone who wants to become pregnant. But what else does ovulation do? I mean, why, why is it so important? Why do we value it so much? This is not something that we typically uh, discuss. And in fact, we're kind of encouraged to not think about our menstruation or think about ovulating until we need it for reproduction, right? So, um, we're trying to kind of smash all of that and say, well, ovulation has all of these benefits. So that's why we chart it. That's why we want to know if we are regularly doing it. So the first thing is that we make our hormones when we ovulate. So it's important to go through regular ovulatory cycles because that's how we make estrogen and progesterone in the right amounts. These are two hormones that need each other to stay in balance. Um, one too heavy or the other too heavy is not the right formula. It really needs to be just right. And as you can see in this graph, they really do have this inverse relationship with each other. The first half is dominated by estrogen and the second half is typically dominated by progesterone. We also build our bones with our hormones. So the ovulatory cycle is really important for bone balance. You have estrogen, which we might be familiar with, uh, how it relates to bone health, but we don't often talk about how progesterone also stimulates bone formation. So we need both progesterone and estrogen in the right amounts to, um, basically during our teen years, we need to build peak bone mass, and then we need to try to, for our, most of our menstrual years, maintain our bone mass so that when we do reach menopause, we have enough uh, bone density to kind of last us for those years where we no longer make our hormones. And as you can see, um, four to six percent of bone mineral density per year can be lost from anovulation. So not ovulating means you're losing somewhere about five percent of your bone mineral density. Um, so it, it, it really is quite impactful. You also have progesterones impacting the circulatory system. And so this is really interesting in how it relates to um, these lifetime protective uh, roles against cardiovascular disease. You want progesterone regularly, which is the result of ovulating regularly, so that you can um, offset several cardiovascular risks. So things like triglycerides and blood pressure, um, endothelial function. Um, so there is documentation in smaller clinical studies to kind of talk about ovulation's power to prevent heart attacks. So it's, again, really good for your long-term heart health to ovulate. We also have brain health, and there's a lot of information about how progesterone supports neuronal development. And actually, if there's brain trauma, it can protect the brain and help the brain regenerate faster. Um, and has all these anti-inflammatory properties. So it's 
again, something that you want to be getting a regular dose of through this act of ovulating. There's also the thyroid and metabolism. So the thyroid, it helps kind of build the block of every sex hormone that you make. You need it to kind of build up this cholesterol that makes testosterone, that makes progesterone and estrogen. So that's the first thing. You really need a good functioning thyroid to even make your sex hormones. And then there's the opposite effect, which is that progesterone also stimulates thyroid hormones. So these you know, ovaries and the adrenals and the thyroid are all doing this dance together where they need to be properly balanced. Um, and this has a lot of impacts for fertility. Um, and of course, your metabolism. So you could suffer from a variety of thyroid issues. And that's going to show up in your menstrual cycle um, in a number of ways. So we'll get to that in a little bit. There's also breast health how progesterone prevents breast soreness. Um, I see a lot of breast soreness, premenstrual breast soreness. And I think that there's, you know, it's really good to track your progesterone, track your basal body temperature so you can see what's going on and that if you're getting enough progesterone to really get those symptoms to go away. And then you've also got estrogen metabolism and how it relates to your gut. So basically we make these hormones and they go to all these different places in our body, but we need to also excrete them in order to, for the cycle to continue essentially. So they get used and then they have to leave. Um, but what can happen when there's impaired uh, gut and that could be leaky gut, that could be a microbiome issue. It really could relate in a couple different ways. Um, but basically unopposed estrogen or estrogen dominance, estrogen excess, these are all ways of actually saying that your estrogen metabolism, the way that your body excretes estrogen is impaired. Um, so we really want to understand the gut if we're talking about the menstrual cycle, because it actually can have a big impact on estrogen, how much estrogen you have and how your chart looks um, when there's extra estrogen recirculating. And connecting the gut, you know, 70% of it is the immune system. So you can't really talk about the immune system without talking about how our body responds to pathogens. And our bodies actually have two main different phases during the menstrual cycle with the immune system. So the first half um, really is more where your, your immunity is better the first half of your menstrual cycle. And then there's a suppression of your immunity during your luteal postovulatory phase. So there's, again, this balance between estrogen and progesterone and how they interact with the immune system. So, the, you know, progesterone is involved in really suppressing that immune response in the lower half of the menstrual cycle to encourage an implantation, right? Um, it's all this process of evolution and how our bodies are working in this balance. There's also the benefits of progesterone being anti-androgenic. So um, basically it helps inhibit this enzyme, which really can make this more powerful testosterone, DHT. And so that causes a lot of symptoms like hair thinning and hair loss that you may see. Um, and also PCOS, which is a, you know, categorized by having excess androgens. This is another reason why you want to encourage someone with PCOS to ovulate more regularly um, because they will make progesterone, which will, again, help them with um, balancing their androgens. And we'll talk about PCOS a little bit more. And that's reishi mushroom, which also inhibits enzyme 5-alpha reductase. So it's interesting our bodies and this mushroom can both make this um, uh, inhibiting, inhibit this enzyme. And then there's estrogen and progesterone's effects for hair and skin. Um, basically, our bodies are, are built in this balance for a reason, um, and it's to keep us looking and feeling good. Um, our hormones are good for how we feel and interpret the world. So we have this very negative view of hormones, that they're this negative thing that makes us um, emotional. However, um, it's really the opposite. Like estrogen is not this mean 
uh, hormone. It's actually this hormone that's very happy. It makes you um, outgoing and it really, you know, boosts dopamine and releases serotonin. So it's really a feel good hormone. And then there's progesterone to balance it in the post ovulatory, which is really about um, enhancing your sleep and lowering your anxiety. So it's a much calmer hormone. So you kind of have estrogen, more of the party hormone, and then progesterone is more of like the homebody hormone. So you really have these two hormones doing this dance and it impacts your mood. We all know that it impacts how we feel to a certain degree. Um, and then progesterone is just really useful for the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So it's really a regulating hormone, really helps your whole endocrine system do its thing efficiently. Um, and we also have the increase of testosterone that comes with ovulation. So estrogen is a feel-good hormone and so is testosterone. So it makes us very horny. It makes us want to have sex, right? So this is, you know, a, again, a product of evolution. And part of the catch of this whole thing is that you are being encouraged hormonally. Um, to have sex during your most fertile period. So here I'm going to kind of switch to now talking about how we use fertility awareness charts for health. How do we not just look at this and understand when you ovulate, but also understand more about your hormones and um, what could possibly be going wrong also if you have different looking charts, charts that don't look like the textbook. So for me, FAM is just really useful for practical purposes. You want to be identifying patterns. And as I've worked with more and more people, I've started to really see those patterns, both the bio profiles of asking people their history, really getting to know where they're from, where they live, what they eat, how they feel, how their relationships are. Those are all important bio profile um, aspects that you really want to ask people if you're going to be doing um, any kind of reading of fertility awareness charts that are not your own. Um, and you also have the bio profile of the person when they take their menstrual charts and when they actually put that information down on the chart. So I think this is really useful for us. We can really understand how to make decisions about our body when we know what's going on. Um, nobody is going to be more invested in your health than you are. And so this really puts the power in your hands where you're starting to get a more intimate profile of your hormones. You know, you can go to the doctor and get a blood test, but as you can see from the charts, our hormones fluctuate quite a bit every single day. And so when you get that test done, when you get that blood drawn can impact the results. And so you only have this very small window into how much uh, of a hormone say is in your blood on that day. Whereas with fertility awareness, we're really seeing the hormones throughout the whole cycle. So we're seeing a much more stabilized data set by seeing the entire cycle and seeing how estrogen works on the entire cycle, seeing how progesterone is doing across the entire cycle. So I also think this is useful because we have a lot of issues with the medical industrial complex and people getting the care that they need. And so a lot of people are very stuck. And so why I teach this method and why I really care about disseminating this information is because I think it helps us in a way, get out of um, being under these uh, these structures that really um, they limit our ability to heal, and they really are not helpful in a lot of ways. They're really just keeping people in a cycle um, where they're not getting the help that they need. So I think that this really helps us undermine those systems and build new systems, ones where the person is empowered. So now I'm going to talk about how it you know, benefits you to really look at your fertility awareness chart and start to see these different aspects of your health. So hormonal health is obviously the first one. We can clearly see progesterone and estrogen and how these things are interacting um, throughout the cycle. So a lot of issues in, that come with you know, menstrual health 
or just health in general can be read by understanding um, what's going on with progesterone and estrogen. So these are things like heavy and painful bleeding or long cycles that you might see with PCOS um, and even tracking mental health symptoms. You're really seeing across the whole cycle um, how these things are, are correlating. You're starting to look at these patterns. Um, and a lot of times it will be quite obvious what is going on if you see it one cycle, two cycles, and by the third cycle, you really have an understanding that this is an issue. So when it comes to PCOS, this is a hormonal health issue that is really rooted in your metabolism and in your endocrine system. So it's not really about um, your ovaries, your ovaries are sort of the victim, your menstrual cycle is trying to tell you something, but they aren't the cause of why you have PCOS. So the name is sort of a misnomer, polycystic ovary syndrome. And really when I'm looking at someone's chart who has PCOS, I'm trying to figure out why do they have uh, ovulatory disruption? What is going on with that? And the first thing to really look at is do they even have PCOS? Because there's both underdiagnosis and overdiagnosis going on of PCOS. So the overdiagnosis is coming from people who are not really looking at the proper criteria to diagnose someone. They're only looking at an ultrasound and then basically telling this person you have PCOS without doing any investigation or actually making sure that, that person fits the criteria. So I have kind of here this first part, which is, do you have PCOS? And this is to look at the other sort of similar conditions to PCOS and if you fall into them. Um, and then the second half is to look at, do you really fit this criteria? Again, the ultrasound is not a sole indicator for diagnosis. What you're looking for really is ovulatory dysfunction, long cycles, and symptoms of androgen excess. So those would again be other biomarkers that you are basically taking through asking someone their symptoms. Um, so that's really how you're going to determine if you even have PCOS. Um, and if you do, if you are presenting that way, there are several different kinds of PCOS. So you have to really understand what is the root of this particular person's PCOS? Is it insulin resistance, which is most people's um, kind of type, or are there other more complex issues related to the metabolism, like your thyroid, could be mineral deficiencies or autoimmune issues. There's a lot of different interactions that could be happening here. So we use charting to understand more about what type of PCOS someone has and how to you know, understand their hormones to help them get better. And a typical PCOS chart looks like this. Um, one is what you're looking at, that long period. It, this is really a, where the body is sort of stuck in the preovulatory phase. So the follicular preovulatory phase is variable in terms of length. And so the body is trying to ovulate, but isn't able to do so until this here it looks like about day 49. So the number two is showing the first patch of cervical fluid where the body was going to go ovulate, but then because of excess androgens or because of thyroid issue, whatever the root cause of their PCOS is, their body decides to forego ovulation and continue along in this sort of estrogen dominant state. As you can see, there's all this fluid patch here, this, this pink that you're seeing. So this person is displaying with a lot of cervical fluid for long periods of time instead of short uh, patch before ovulation. And then their cycle is just continuing on in this preovulatory state. And then three denotes another sort of wet patch. See the, the pink is getting darker to denote that it's a more fertile type of fluid. And then finally, number four here is showing they finally ovulate at the end here and finish their cycle two weeks later at day 53. So this is typically how a PCOS chart is going to look. If someone starts charting and they're dealing with PCOS, this is typically what you're going to see. Um, also, if you're transitioning off of contraceptives, you will typically present with a PCOS-like chart where you'll have long follicular phase 
and then uh, hopefully normal um, post ovulatory phase. So there you can just compare to what a healthy menstrual cycle would look like. There's basically two halves to the menstrual cycle, the pre-ovulation, the point of ovulation, which is circled, and then the post-ovulation, you can see that they're about half and half. And then you also have the bar graph to show you cervical fluid, which is again, just this one patch that occurs before ovulation and during ovulation itself. And then the vaginal canal is dry for the rest of the cycle. So you really just have this fertility window in here. Whereas someone with PCOS, they, they aren't fertile for this whole time, but they're presenting with fertile quality fluid for this whole time. They're actually only fertile at this point here, and then ovulation occurs here, and then their post-ovulation phase. So you can see once more, more in balance, and then how does fibroids or ovarian cysts, endometrial hyperplasia, how are these um, impaired estrogen metabolism related uh, conditions, how are they presenting in a chart? And again, the cervix is just under the hormonal regulation of estrogen. So estrogen is basically telling the body to make fertile quality cervical mucus if there is a lot of it, if it, it's in high amounts. And so with someone who has these issues that are related to estrogen, they're going to usually see uh, an excess of cervical fluid on a daily basis. So it might not be one small patch of six to nine days in the center of the cycle. Instead, it may be several patches of varying quality uh, wet cervical mucus. And this is, again, a way of seeing through this bar graph uh, excess estrogen. There's more estrogen than there is dry periods. And um, so that really can show you kind of what's at the root of what your estrogen metabolism is doing and how can you support your pathways to um, healthy estrogen metabolism. So that would mean supporting your liver and supporting your gut. In FAM charts, we also see lots and lots of thyroid and adrenal problems because, again, like I talked about earlier, the ovaries, the adrenals, and the thyroid are all interacting um, really intimately. So thankfully, with basal body temperature, we have this amazing way to measure our thyroid because we're actually measuring our resting metabolic rate. So you're taking your temperature in the morning and you're actually measuring your body's temperature at rest. And the other advantage to that is that you get to see what range your thyroid health is in. And so typically with Fahrenheit here, um, we have temperatures in the pre-ovulatory to post-ovulatory. You're looking in the 97s to 98 degree uh, Fahrenheit. So that is generally a good range for thyroid health and metabolic health. And then you also have hypothyroidism, slow thyroid, which is presenting with lower temperatures. So typically that person will have um, lower waking temperatures in the 95, 96 range to 96, 97, low 97 range. Um, and then the opposite is hyperthyroidism or fast thyroid where you are presenting in more like the 98 to 99 range. So you can kind of see over the course of a whole cycle what range your temperatures were in, and that can tell you what, what your thyroid and what your metabolism is doing. Um, so it's pretty interesting that we also have this extra uh, window into our thyroid health. So this isn't the best image, but you can see a uh, hyperthyroid chart will typically look short. So this one was only 23 cycle days and they had high temperatures in the 98s and 99s um, with luteal phase or post ovulatory phase that was particularly short. So we can see in fertility awareness charts, this kind of presentation of hyperthyroidism and also hypothyroidism where you have extra long cycles, low temperatures, and infrequent ovulation. There's also endometriosis, which is pretty complex, and there's a, a lot to talk about 
um, in terms of how this is really, what's the best strategy for dealing with endometriosis? It really depends on each person, but fertility awareness is really essential for being able to track your symptoms, understand your pain, and if it's triggered, is it related to estrogen? There's really no conclusive research. We know that estrogen is a proliferative hormone, so it's not the cause of endometriosis, but it certainly can help those endometriosis lesions grow larger by having uh, excess estrogen. So these are all things that you could be charting and trying to understand working with your practitioners to um, see how, how your endometriosis is progressing. And also if you do get excision surgery, it can help you in the recovery understand uh, how your symptoms are doing. And so fertility awareness is really just this window into who you are. You're looking at so many aspects, right? Like I'm just taking three separate observations about myself each day. And one of them is right when I wake up, barely remember it. The second one is just throughout the day when I'm using the bathroom or doing other really normal things like about to have sex or whatever. So I'm just doing these really benign things, but then I'm actually getting this huge window into how I feel, uh, how my body is doing, what I feel like doing in terms of my creativity or um, how tired I am. So you have all of these things that you can really understand from fertility awareness. Like in this first chart on the left that you're seeing, I traveled and you can see that it delayed my ovulation by a whole 10 days just to be on this. I went, I went to Cuba and we had an amazing time, but I walked like 20 miles. And so my body was like, no, we're going to take 10 days and then we're going to reset and do this thing. So I'm able to see that right through, through my charting. So it's just this really amazing um, way to integrate, you know, a true autonomy into your healthcare. And um, I think that that's really valuable for so many different reasons. And you don't have to use this information, but it's really good to know that it's there. It's really good to know that you can identify your fertility, that you can identify your ovulation, and that you can get a handle on your hormones and your health and really stick to your gut if, uh, you know, a healthcare practitioner doesn't agree with you or, um, you know, you, you have some, something to work with here um, where you're not just left to what somebody else is telling you about your body. You can really take all this data and uh, make the interpretations yourself. And that really is a powerful thing. So I also have a podcast where you can listen to more information about all the science behind all of this. I'm really interested in the scientific aspect and my Patreon as well, where I really talk about all kinds of specific issues related to contraception and related to um, just menstrual life. And um, you can connect with me at Fam Taught Me. That's, that's really where all of my work is on Twitter and Instagram and all of that. Um, so that's, that's all I got for you today. Let's see. Wow. Go... That was, <laughs> it was so good. Oh, um, awesome. We have a lot of <laughs> questions. You ready? Awesome. Could you mention uh, what high androgen XX excess symptoms would look like? Yeah, so androgen excess symptoms would look like um, a lot of male pattern hair growth. So that would mean like stubble type hair growth, hirsutism, it, you may have heard it called. And that would be like on the chin or chin strap acne that would kind of look sort of like a pubescent person's acne, cheeks and chin and neck and things like that. Um, other symptoms of androgen excess would be um, weight that you just can't seem to kind of take off. It's almost like a bloated type of weight, a little bit like of a water type of weight. Um, and that feels unhealthy, like an unhealthy amount of weight would be another symptom of androgen excess. So you have all these different presentations um, for someone that is dealing with androgen excess, but the menstrual cycle is a really good way of uh, seeing what that cycle looks like and, and really connecting all those dots together. 
Any advice for staying in rhythm as birth workers who may not sweep a pattern that follows the, how do you say that word? Circadian? Circadian rhythm, yeah. Yeah, no, this is a great question. Um, just because we live on so many different schedules. Um, so I think what's important here is to try to take that reading when you get your nightly rest, whenever that period is. So there may be days where you stay up for 24 hours. And so you would simply skip that observation day. And then you would wait until the next time that your body is actually at full rest or in bed, you're going to like go to sleep. So even if that is slightly irregular in terms of the timing of it and how long it is, whenever you get your like bulk sleep for the night, that would be when I would try to have that thermometer like on top of my phone so that when I roll over, I grab it first. Um, Does having irregular length of cycle indicate an unhealthy cycle? Well, there's a there's a range of what is healthy, and that's typically bet somewhere between 25 and 35 days. So this, the ovulation day may change, and that may change the total cycle length. Um, but particularly long cycles show that your body is trying to ovulate but isn't able to actually get to that hormonal peak. Um, when it should in that kind of center part of the cycle. And so we really want to figure out, well, why is ovulation having a hard time? Why is ovulation not occurring as frequently as it should? So in terms of like hitting that 28 days every single cycle, that's not realistic. And um, it's not something that you even have to worry about because it's not abnormal to for it to be slightly different from month to month. But you, you do want to start looking at what an underlying health issue might be if you're hitting regularly hitting past 35 days um, for each menstrual cycle. Would, ta would taking synthetic progesterone and pill form counter symptoms that encounter from having low levels of pre-progesterone in your body or there are additional risk? Are there more natural modalities that can stimulate progesterone development in your body? Yeah, so progestins are different from progesterone. Um, progesterone is what our body makes after ovulation in the corpus luteum, but progestins are synthesized in uh, the lab and they fit into progesterone receptors, but they are not progesterone itself. So they actually chemically look structurally more like testosterone. All of the hormones look rather similar chemically, but basically it's, it's its own chemical, the progestins, and they don't metabolize into allopregnenolone, which is what progesterone metabolizes into in your body and gives you all of these positive effects. So when you take progestins, you're actually not taking progesterone. So it doesn't metabolize and it doesn't have all of these um, neuroprotective effects. And um, a lot of the good mood effects are missing from progestins. That's why someone taking birth control doesn't feel the same as someone who ovulates regularly in terms of their mood. There's a lot more um, implications for mood swings when you're taking progestins. However, if you have low progesterone and you're trying to figure out how to deal with that, instead of taking progestins, you can take micronized progesterone, which is a cream-based topical progesterone that is bioidentical to our uh, homemade progesterone. Um, and there's also Vitex Agnus Castus, which is a very well-known progesterone enhancing herb. So if you're trying to deal with a short luteal phase or um, a very low progesterone, like your temperatures aren't really doing a nice um, rise, you could use Vitex to help stimulate um, progesterone. And that has to do with the ovarian follicle, right? Because that follicle is what makes the progesterone. That corpus luteum actually has to develop properly in order to make that progesterone in the right amounts. So you're really talking about supporting the ovarian follicles to get the end result of higher progesterone. Nice. When you say Vitex, could you speak a little bit more on what that is? Yeah, Vitex is, uh, it's the berry of a, a tree, um, the fruit of the tree, and it is a natural progesterone enhancer. So I, I'm not sure about the specifics of how it is doing that enhancement, 
and how it is supporting the ovarian follicle, but it seems to um, be primarily used with dong kwai in, in a herbal combination um, to reset the menstrual cycle hormones of estrogen and progesterone. And you would recommend that for someone who is on birth control or like a hormonal suppressant? Yeah, it, it, it won't help very much during the use of it, but it will help in the transition out of it um, if you stop using contraceptives, just because contraceptives work by basically suppressing ovulation. So there is no progesterone. So even if you take Vitex, it's not like you're using Vitex to replace progesterone, it would just be enhancing progesterone. A little bit distinction there. What particular mood irregularly are attributed to irregular and hyper and hypo levels of estrogen and progesterone? Um, the question is about mood? Mm -hmm. Mood irregularities. Okay mood irregularities and how that relates to estrogen and progesterone. Well, basically our hormones are there for so many other reasons besides um, releasing the egg. And one of those things is to make us feel good. So you have estrogen in this short, um, high, am high amounts, but only for a short period of time during the middle of the cycle. That's where you feel outgoing and you feel most able to um, interact with others. It's a very extroverted hormone. And then you have the balance of progesterone in the post-ovulatory phase to really help calm you. So if you have mood irregularities, you could look through your fertility awareness chart to see if there is an excess of estrogen, if your progesterone is too low and see how that is impacting um, your moods. And also definitely look at how your temperatures are because that thyroid um, can really impact how you feel. And so you could be looking at estrogen, progesterone, and your thyroid through fertility awareness to really get a sense of, is my depression or anxiety in any way physiological? Um, are the, is that related at all to me getting better? I realize I'm in doing body literacy techniques without thinking, and there are are there any apps and resources you recommend to compile or review our fertility cycles? Yeah, um, that's awesome. I think that's kind of what I was talking about at the beginning, that fertility awareness. There are so many people that are like, oh, I under, I've been doing that. I, I do understand what's going on to a certain degree with my body, even though I haven't been necessarily charting it. And um, there's two different ways that you can go about this. I created a fertility awareness charting journal so that people could take their data off of the um, internet basically and have it in a more private uh, hand held way. So you could use a physical chart if you're into journaling to put it into that modality where you really have free space and creativity and you can get your gel pens and go crazy. Um, and so there's the uh, apps option, which is the other option. The biggest upside is that it's very simple and it's already set up for you. The biggest downside is that you might be sharing that information with an advertiser or um, health researchers, or you might be sharing your data with others. So that's something to keep in mind. But I like Kindara, and the reason why is because it does not make predictions. So as a fertility awareness user for contraception, it's really important that we are um, really in charge of our data and that we're not letting others make decisions for us. So I like Kindara because it's very clean and clear, easy to read the data, but also you are in charge of it. So you need to know how to interpret it. And I think that's a really important thing that the user is educated and skilled. Um, and there's other apps like Clue is another one that has good privacy. Um, but some of these other ones like uh, Glow or Flow, um, these are owned by big venture capitalists and they are taking your data for a reason. So really do your research and try to figure out who is the best online option for you. Can you talk about what perimenopause does to this tracking? Sure. So perimenopause is... Um, it's an interesting term and there's a lot of debate about it within fertility awareness circles. When does it begin? When do we start talking about 
uh, this, is there really as big of a drop off with fertility as we're being told? And um, in perimenopause, you might see a skipped ovulation. So you might see a normal cycle length, but the ovulation doesn't happen. Um, then you bleed and then you start over and maybe you have another ovulation. So there might be periods of anovulation, so anovulatory cycles. Um, there could also be sort of a place where you are using the custom categories to mark off any other symptoms that are not directly hormonal related, um, anything weird that you're feeling or any changes that you're feeling. Um, sometimes it's going to present as long cycles, but it, often in perimenopause, the menstrual cycle is still robust um, and still doing its thing. Uh, for a while, if there are underlying health issues that weren't addressed, or if someone used contraceptives for a while to maybe kind of suppress a, a hormonal health issue, those things in perimenopause could come up more uh, abruptly in the charts. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind, depending on the person's um, reproductive health history. How are you defining fertility window? I see on the cycle you went to Cuba, for instance, that you noted a very large fertile window that started well before you ovulated. Yeah, so I've been using fertility awareness for contraception purposes for the past five years with my partner. And we use the four rules for contraception that are laid out in the book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility. Um, it's also known as the symptothermal method of contraception, and it's part of what I am now trying to teach others. So in that particular case uh, where we went on a trip, um, my fertile window began on the first day that I observed cervical fluid that was of wet quality. So I actually start my fertile window on that very first day where my vagina goes from being dry the day before to wet the next day. And that's usually where my cervical fluid patch is going to begin. And it will lead up to that ovulation. But what happened in that cycle is my ovulation actually was suppressed from all of this travel and time zones and airports and everything. So my body actually shut that process down, went back to dry for a few days, and then my fertility window began again. And so in the fertility awareness method, in order to make sure that we are using contraception correctly, I actually knew not to resume unprotected sex because my temperature didn't rise, no ovulation occurred. And so I had to extend my fertile window, assume that my fertility was still coming, but that it was delayed. And sure enough, I had another cervical fluid patch. And then finally, I saw the rise in temperature that signifies ovulation occurred. And that tells me when the cutoff is basically to resume unprotected sex without chance of pregnancy. Wow. How does tracking went on birth control, for example, I'm on Explanon and will spot per week. So how does tracking work when on birth control? Yeah, so tracking, it's interesting. It's different with different types of birth control. If you're using a hormonal birth control, the method of action of that birth control is to sever the connection between the brain and the ovaries. So the ovaries cannot hear the messages from the brain to um, start the process of ovulation. And so ovulation just gets suppressed. So the hormonal cycling is actually dysregulated. And so what you'll see is a completely erratic looking chart. Um, you won't actually be able to chart ovulation on birth control because it's stopping you from ovulating. So what you'll see is a very erratic up and down temperatures and erratic patches of cervical fluid. And then when you take the sugar pills, or if you take the sugar pills at the end, you will have a bleed, but you are actually not having a menstrual cycle. You're having a withdrawal bleed from the lack of taking those synthetic um, progestin and, and estrogen, you're, you're basically just bleeding out um, without those, that steady dose of hormones. Um, so if you're taking, um, I'm sorry, if you're using an IUD instead of taking pills, you can have somewhat uh, a preservation of your ovulation. So something like the copper IUD is not necessarily going to be able to shut down ovulation 100% of the time. And it works through other methods of action. And so 
if you are using an IUD, you may be able to see the thermal shift of ovulation through the basal body temperature. And I've actually had a few people who are charting on their IUDs and we're seeing maybe two thirds of the time that they're ovulating. Um, there's still quite a bit of time where their their cycles are erratic or not not ovulatory looking. But yeah, so hormonal birth control, it's not really going to tell you very much, um, but the IUD will be able to see ovulation. Could be why we see IUDs and placentas sometimes. <laughs> that could be it. I know it's funny because it's 99.9 .9 effective, but I'm like, well, I've seen some alternative images. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> A few more questions. Um, if you have PMDD, do you recommend birth control? So PMDD is interesting because it's, um, while it's relatively new um, in terms of it uh, becoming a recognized um, condition, but we don't know enough about how it works. It seems like from what we do know that progesterone the person is really sensitive to the normal fluctuations of progesterone. So there's nothing wrong with the person's hormonal pattern who has PMDD. They don't have a hormone imbalance, but their body uh, is doing something abnormal, reacting abnormally to that normal rise in progesterone that we see after ovulation. So birth control could, for instance, shut down ovulation and therefore, um, keep progesterone low, but progesterone has so many other protective effects that I'm not sure that this is the answer to dealing with PMDD. It will sort of, you know, really even you out in terms of you'll stop this hormonal process of um, estrogen and progesterone cycling. Um, but the question is, do, you know, is this the answer to dealing with um, this person's hypersensitivity to progesterone, and I'm not sure that it is. Um, so I'm the jury's still out on that one. I'm I'm not sure about uh, how it will work for the individual, um, but most times I would lean towards not using birth control, which was not developed for PMDD to treat PMDD. How could fertility awareness techniques help people transition after changing? or getting off birth control methods? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I like when people start charting beforehand and really learn the skill of fertility awareness because it is obviously something you have to practice every day. Um, but I think it it's good to start charting beforehand so you have that skill. And then when you get off of fertility, I mean, when you get off of birth control and you start fertility awareness charting, you will actually see your first ovulations and you'll actually see your first anovulations. I noticed that many people don't really recover from birth control for at least three to six months on average. So when we're actually charting that and seeing that, I'm seeing that their first cycles are not ovulatory and they're seeing it too, which is very interesting. So we're kind of gathering all this bio data about the transition and how long it actually takes for fertility to return. Um, and for the hormone cycling to return, because still you want those hormones. Um, they're good for you, even if you don't want to start conceiving. I've encouraged friends to try FAM. They say the data and int interpretation is not useful because they're on hormonal birth control. Would you say it's still helpful for insights you're sharing? Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, again, it's hormonally the the chart is not going to look like a menstrual cycle chart will. Um, and birth control also impacts your sex hormones significantly, right? It's sort of getting into that system and changing the way that it was designed. Um, so I think it is good to chart while you are using birth control. However, more in the sense of that you are making sure that you understand how the drug is affecting you. Um, for me, when I took birth control, I really like lost myself and it was very um, rough for me emotionally and um, mentally. So I didn't know at the time what to look out for. And so if I had had this skill of charting, I would have been able to identify better. Um, and it was really the people around me that helped me identify what was going on. But I think that, yeah, it, it's not going to help you identify ovulation that isn't there but it'll certainly help you in terms of it being like a full body 
um, chart or a way to take your bio data, it can certainly help you identify when you have side effects or um, when it's not working for you anymore. And last question is, can you provide your contact info again? Yeah, of course. I'll type it in the chat. But it's Sam taught me it started off with me basically learning this information and getting really, 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 really mad that no one had told me about it. And so I was like, I'm going to tell people what I've learned so far. And so I created this hashtag on Twitter and have since kind of expanded it outwards to working with others and trying to disseminate this information more widely so that we understand our bodies and that we can make better decisions for ourselves. Thank you guys so much. It was really so much Thank fun. Thank you. To this was wonderful. Uh, I can't wait to watch the replay. <laughs> I've been oh taking gosh. notes down. I don't know if you were watching. <laughs> I love it. Good, good, good. Um, yeah, there's just, there's so much that really can come of this. And each person that learns about it, we tell others about it. And um, yeah, I just think that there's so many good implications for it. Thank you all for coming. It was really, really great. Yes, enjoy your evening. Yeah, you too. I'll see you guys on the next two. Bye. Okay.